Hello Booktube! As I've mentioned in many videos, perhaps a nauseating amount of videos, there is a tech apocalypse going on here at Hyde Cottage. A war between me and my technology that bids fair to have no winners. <laughs> uh, but there are nevertheless favorites. Every once in a while I will try a technological combination that I want to work. I want it to work. If it doesn't work, I'm not going to penalize you, and I'm not going to penalize myself. So I will leave it behind, but there are some things, some combinations of technology that actually work for me, just in my workflow, better than others. And today is one of those. This particular video is one of those combinations that, ideally, I would really like this to work more than any of the others. It would be much more convenient for me. Not the dramatic blowing curtain. That won't always be true. It, there's almost never any kind of breeze uh, here. But the rest of it. Is the video quality here good enough? Is the audio quality here good enough? Will there be glitches? Will there be stalls? That sort of thing. Uh, I'm going to hope. I, I look forward to your comments on the subject, but I figured we would do at least a video to test it out. And fortunately, there is subject matter for a video. Because as I've mentioned uh, in the last few days, it looks like a little heat wave is coming to Boston. Uh, it looks like the temperatures are going to go up steadily this weekend and then on Monday bolt into the stratosphere so that suddenly you will go from mid-80s Fahrenheit as a high for the day, which is nice and warm but nothing, nothing emergency, nothing that really warrants notice. It's a normal summer day for it to be in the mid-80s in Fahrenheit in the middle of the day in, the late, in late June. But rather on Monday and maybe going Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe even Thursday, temperatures going into the upper 90s Fahrenheit, which is something to notice. That is where you start to have people have heat-related health problems. That is where you start to get warnings from the, the government, from the, the Boston government, to check on your neighbors, to check on the elderly, to check on the vulnerable, especially people who aren't in air-conditioned circumstances, that sort of thing. And for that to continue over days at a time means that you're not having any chance to cool off at night. It looks like that is actually coming to Boston. It is uh, a little bit alarming that it's coming to Boston in June, but it, it looks like it's going to happen. And uh, I had early morning appointments uh, yesterday that were canceled and I postponed some of them and managed to reschedule some of them for today. And so I went to the Brattle Bookshop, which is a used bookstore in downtown Boston I, it, it, that's relatively near where my appointments were. I was able to go there, and I had an extra urge to go there as to stock up on books <laughs> to get ready for the heat wave. I don't need to stock up on books. I have plenty of books, but when you're in the mood... Any, any uh, justification will do. So I went, and I had a grand time. Ran into old friends, of course, ran into the staff. One of you had called in a generous gift certificate, so that helps as well, although the Brattle is really two bookstores. The Brattle Bookshop is really two bookstores. There's the normal, what you would consider a normal used bookstore, a very good one, one of the oldest ones in the country, uh, that's just three stories full crammed with books on all kinds of subjects. But really, there's another. There's a second Brattle bookstore, which is the sale lot next door. The store has uh, bargain bins and bargain shelves of $1, $3, and $5 books. But unlike most used bookstores that might have one wheelbarrow of those outside, they have thousands. They have a whole lot full of sale books, which really has a different ecosystem, uh, often different staff, a very different feel to it. Uh, you go into the main bookstore, you expect a certain kind of accountability. It might be minimal in some circumstances because the Brattle has an active customer traffic, so the books don't always get put back where they belong. But uh, in the sale lot, there is no accountability at all. It's, it's organized only by price. And even then, someone will grab a $5 book, they'll walk around with it for a while, they'll go off to one side of the lot, examine it a little, realize they don't want it, and just jam it onto the nearest cart. And that cart might be a $1 cart. So even then, there's a little bit of slippage, but not, not as much. <laughs> but that curtain is really dramatic, isn't it? It's, I swear, I don't have anything dramatic to talk to you about. It's just a pile of books. I went to the Brattle, and I got a pile of books, and I want to talk to them about you. I'll talk to you about them. And we'll start with uh, two mass market paperbacks, two older mass market paperbacks from authors that I have known. They've largely fallen away completely. 
So we will see. I have read both of these books, but I haven't read either one of them in a long time. The first one is Brendan Gill, and this is Ways of Loving. This is a 1970s collection of short stories about relationships, New York. This is basically the stuff that uh, Brooklyn-based debut authors of the made-up stories are still churning out today. It's, it's all very precise. It's all very uh, anecdotal and quotable. None of the people sound real. None of the situations are re even remotely normal. <clears throat> it's mainly meant to reflect flattering light back upon the author, just the way everything coming out of Williamsburg is today. Uh, I haven't read this in quite some time. Brendan Gill wrote this. Uh, I don't think this was his first fictional effort. He's, he's written other, he wrote other fictional things. And then just, I think, a couple of years after he wrote this thing, uh, he wrote a book called Here at the New Yorker about his time at the magazine, at, at the New Yorker magazine, and it sold like crazy. I mean, a million times more than everything else that he ever wrote put together. It was uh, Book of the Month Club, it was a New York Times bestseller, it was translated into a million languages, the paperback deal was astronomical. So, uh, I, it was really, I mean, he may have written fiction after Here at the New Yorker, I'm not 100% sure, but Here at the New Yorker sort of turned the page on this kind of Brendan Gill. But this paperback is in perfect condition. Uh, so uh, I grabbed it. I haven't read Ways of Loving since it first came out. So we'll give it a try and see. I, I was I liked a couple of the stories in here before, but for a dollar I wasn't going to turn it down. Uh, and then this next one, good lord, I haven't read this, this next one in 30 years. Oh, it's more than that, because <laughs> I read this when it first came out. Uh, I've never seen this paperback edition. This is The author is Wilfred Sheed. Uh, and this is his book, The Hack, about a, a writer who's losing his writing ability, he's losing his simpatico with his family, he's losing his Catholic faith. Uh, I, 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 this was not Wilfred Cheed's first novel. He had a breakout novel that's the name is escaping me at the moment. But this had to be one of his earliest books after that. And I read it uh, when it seemed like he might be the next new big thing. Uh, and I don't remember liking it all that much, but it's been a long, long time, so I'm happy. I've never seen this paperback. I grabbed it right away. These are two sort of dated authors. They, they don't have a living presence anymore. The closest that you get is that you can hardly walk into a used bookstore anywhere in the English-speaking world without encountering a copy of here at the New Yorker. Sadly, none of that is true for Wilfred Sheet. He has a, a, a collection of his nonfiction pieces that was once made, I'm sure it doesn't exist anymore, uh, called uh, Not in Anger, I think was the name of it. And I really like it, really do. His nonfiction is terrific, but I don't think I have anything else by this author at the moment. The good word and other words, that sort of thing. Once upon a time, he had a kind of vogue. So did Brendan Gill, but not anymore. <laughs> so I got two cheap paperbacks. Then I got uh, two, th these were all cheap, but I got two cheap Vintage hardcovers. The Brattle got a huge collection of vintage hardcovers that they've just been piecemealing out over the last year. And by vintage, I mean 100 years old, where the original owner kept them in excellent condition and put those plastic library covers on them. So it's, it's a completely painless and interesting reading experience to just go back in time. Uh, this one... Uh, this one was from... Oh my, are you not going to tell me? All right, well, this, this book doesn't actually tell me the date of this, but this novel is 100 years old. Uh, this is The Postmaster of Market Dainton by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This lovely period cover. See, this is the original hardcover that somebody just took really good care of and was being sold in the Brattle lot for a song. And I've read a lot. E. Phillips Oppenheim wrote a lot of books, a pile, a library of his own of books. And I've read quite a few of them. I've praised him on this channel before. I've shown you uh, plenty of like his spy fiction or that sort of thing. Uh, but I don't think I've ever read this one. It seems like it's a murder mystery. Uh, we get a very sure, short description. The baffling murder mystery surrounding the death of a patient of a successful young doctor upon whom suspicion falls. How the doctor at last clears his name makes such an ingenious novel that it is not until the last page is reached that the problem is solved. So not not technically a murder mystery. This author was way too well known to sink to what we would consider to be simple genre fiction. Uh, he's totally forgotten. He's 100% out of print. He will never come back into print. No one anywhere, including right here, 
is making any argument that uh, E. Phillips Oppenheim was some lost literary genius. Not at all. He was. He wrote purely to entertain, and he admitted that. And he did entertain millions of readers. And what a thrill it is, in a way, in an odd way, to pick up a hardcover that is exactly the hardcover that would have been picked up for... Uh, are you going to tell me? No, you're not going to tell me. But this, this wouldn't have been more than a few shillings to buy when it originally came out. It's never been reprinted. So, And the same thing with this next one. This next one was another one of these vintage old hardcovers. That someone, obviously the same collection, someone obviously took very good care of it. But this one does have a precedent, and, and I have a prop for it. Now, is this going to tell me the date? This is an American publisher, so it should. 1941. Uh, this came out in 1941, and it was... Uh, okay, it doesn't... It doesn't tell me how much it costs, but probably 50 cents. Uh, and this is by uh, Earl Stanley Gardner, another writer, just like E. Phillips Oppenheim, an, a writer who never stopped writing. A vast amount of books, to, to this author's credit. A huge library of his own. Uh, and this one is called uh, The D.A. Cooks a Goose. And when I saw it, I, I gave a little squeal of happiness because I'm, I'm just catching up with all the fads of the 1940s. <laughs> because a while ago, at the Brattle, I found this. The DA calls it murder. I hauled it on this channel. This and this is the story of a crusading young district attorney, new to his job, fielding his corrupt rivals, his corrupt opponents, dealing with the uh, crusading but uh, true, true-hearted female reporter for a sympathetic newspaper. Uh, and this this murder mystery deals with a dead body found in a hotel room, and. It, it looks natural, but it, the DA calls it murder. The DA is not satisfied. And uh, I realized, once I once I read the book and really liked it, uh, that it was part of a series. That, that this particular character and his sort of uh, context took off for Earl Stanley Gardner, so he just kept writing books. And this is one of them. This, I don't think this is the next one. The DA Cooks a Goose, I don't think is the next one. Uh, I don't know if this is going to tell me. Uh, any of the others. No, it doesn't. There are quite a few of these, though, and I would love to find them all. Of course, now I'm a little spoiled, because now I want them all in these original hardcovers, and I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but I'm, this is going to be a delight. If it's anything like the first one, it's going to be a delight. And these were all, thanks to your uh, very generous gift certificate from one of you, and thanks to the cheap prices at the Brattle anyway, these didn't put me out of pocket anything at all. Uh, then this next one is uh, a little... A little call up north, where I believe a heat wave is still headed. This is the state of Maine. Uh, this is called In Maine by John N. Cole, who was for a long time the editor of Maine Times. And this is a collection of his Maine-loving columns, regular columns that he wrote for the paper about curious aspects of Maine character or topography or wildlife or whatever. Uh, and uh, Maine, for those of you who aren't familiar with the United States, is a very, is a it's way up north. It's in the, the, the extreme north of New England. Uh, it's heavily wooded. It's heavily rustic. And it's usually heavily autumnal, even in summer. But Maine is my friend, my old friend Deb, who's on this channel quite often in live streams, although not as often as I would like, <laughs> uh, is currently up in Maine. She's from Maine. Uh, and she reports that all the weather forecasters up there are saying we, that the heat wave that is coming to Boston is coming to Maine as well. Which means, I assume, that it will also engulf Vermont, which is largely in between here in Maine. Uh, so this would be a New England thing, and it's not usual in June. But this is this is a slim little thing. I don't think I was ever going to find it. So And, and as far as I know, uh, this author and his column are long gone. So it'll be fun to commune with, uh, with the voice from, a voice from the past. Uh, then this next one is Oxford India Paperbacks. This is the only... Oxford India paperback I have ever seen. <laughs> and I saw it. I had this once before uh, and got rid of it. The minute I saw it at the Brattle, I realized I didn't have a copy. And I, I really enjoyed it. So I was happy to find another one in better condition than the one I don't have anymore. This is by Ranan, Raman Sukumar. Uh, and it's called Elephant Days and Nights. Ten Years with the Indian Elephant. See that, that label up there? I've never seen that on another Oxford book. So maybe it was a whole series they did, but that maybe it was UK only and it never came here. And this is, it has uh, illustrations. It has color and black and white photos uh, of the Indian elephant. Uh, and this is just a thorough natural history of the Indian elephant. 
uh, what it's like, what the gender dimorphism, what uh, breeding cycles, behavior, rudiments of cultural understanding, the clashes between Indian elephants and humans, all that sort of thing. This is just the fundamental book on the Indian elephant, uh, which is very different from the African elephant in many, many ways. I have encountered both of these animals in the wild many times. And Indian elephants can be a little predictable, especially if you catch one in a bad mood. Uh, but they are, on the whole, much smaller and much more tractable than their African cousins. African elephants, especially uh, bull males, uh, are not very amenable. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Uh, if you are walking along in the countryside, for instance, in India, and you encounter an elephant, so you're looking way down a wooded road and you see one at that's walking up the road towards you, and maybe it isn't aware of you yet. Maybe it's maybe you're upwind, so it's not aware of you yet, or downwind. Uh, you have all sorts of options, but pants crapping terror probably isn't going to be one of them. Probably not. Whereas if you were in, if you were unlucky enough, as I have been, to be in a similar situation in Africa, to be walking along in the chaparral, and you're looking at uh, oh, isn't this pretty? There's an old abandoned termite mound, and there's a row of trees, and over in the distance over there is a mountain, and then over the tops of the trees, suddenly you see a head peek up. A gigantic gray head. And you realize that a full-grown male elephant is right behind that stand of trees, and has been aware of you for some time, and is now deciding to look over the trees at you. That is a frankly terrifying moment. It's not the same thing as encountering it. Usually, it's not the same thing as encountering an Indian elephant. Uh, it, it, Indian elephants also have a long, long history of labor and abuse in India. I've encountered quite a few of them when I lived in the country. So, and I, I really enjoyed this book. It's, it's very uh, astringently sort of uh, academically written, but very, still very readable. Uh, it'll go in the, my natural history collection, and now, this time, I'll hope not to get rid of it. Uh, then this next one, mm, I don't know what's the find of the day here. There are quite a few that might that might vie for that distinction. This one would come close. This is a collection I have never had. I have read some of these pieces, but I have never had this collection. This is Mary McCarthy's theater criticism. <laughs> Her theater criticism for a New York periodical where once a month she did a column about theater in New York. The periodical didn't really care about the column, and they didn't really care about theater, so she had a what, a, what columnists always dream of. She had a largely free hand. And she admits uh, at the beginning of this volume that uh, she's just including everything here. Uh, even though her earliest theatrical criticism now embarrasses her. Uh, I wonder if I can find it right away. Uh, no, I don't think I can. Uh, oh, well, but well, there is one great line, though. She includes all of her earliest reviews, even though uh, they aren't any good. <laughs> even though, by her own estimation, they aren't any good. Her fans might think otherwise, but even so... Uh, she says, in the first fourth of the book, the reader will find quite a few sentences which make me wince with pain to read over, but which I have let stand in the interest of the record, and because I think anyone who could write so foolishly owes a debt to society that cannot be cancelled only by the mere process of getting older. <laughs> uh, I, this will be an absolute treat to reread. I am not. In case you are wondering, I always complain about my books on books, my collected criticism bookcase, and how it's. I moved everything over there in order to give it more room, and it instantly became overcrowded, and now is fatally overcrowded. You might be thinking, well, okay, now you're branching out, but I'm not, I promise. I know I got that huge volume of John Simon theater criticism, and I have Mary McCarthy, but I'm not branching out to theater criticism. I am not. I'm not going to cram it into that bookcase, and I'm not going to start another bookcase. There are only a couple of volumes of theater criticism that I actually want. Uh, Walter Kerr's book, a book, Journey to the Heart of Broadway, I would very much, if I found a copy of that, I would very much get it. I've had one before in the past, but I notice I don't anymore. 
But other than that, this was a totally unexpected thing, and I, I'm happy to have it, but it is not going to cause a second craze. Uh, and then this next one, this next one was prompted by Vermont. I, I keep mentioning Vermont. I, for those of you who are new to the channel, I, the, I took uh, my dog Frida up to Vermont for a two-week vacation at the 190-year-old house of Mark Richardson, a fellow booktuber, Richardson Reads. Uh, and as I mentioned the other day, I mentioned that I have I have Hyde Cottage here, but then I, I have a little book room. It's it's where my, my bed is, it's where a nightstand is, it's where the AC unit is, and it's my little book room. It is four books. Everything else here, there are books lining all the walls, but the bookcases don't jut out into the rooms. There's nothing double stacked, there are no piles anywhere. The bookcases line the rooms as much as decorative furniture as a place for me to go and look for books. So, in other words, what the, the goal that I kind of want, the aesthetic goal, is if somebody walks into this place, they will see, ah, okay, well, isn't that a nice effect? There are bookcases lining all the walls here, but they won't feel like they're in some sort of hoarding situation. And that isn't true. That's true as well in my little book room. My little book room is crammed with books, but it, I believe, still is tasteful. It's just, it has a door that can close. No one else is, is, is welcome in there. All the rest of this is open territory. And I, I said the other day that every reader really ought to, you really ought to try to have a little book room of your own. It really is amazingly restorative to have. And it can be done even in some of the smallest spaces. If you think creatively, it's possible to do. You don't actually need a room if you've got tall bookcases. You can make a little cubby for yourself. It's the first thing I do whenever I go anywhere. When, or rather, whenever I, use, whenever I change locations, when I change homes, the first thing I always look for before I do anything else, before I check about the utilities or the, the stove, does it work, or anything like that, I check to see if there's a tiny little space that I can make into my book room. Uh, and the the goal, really, of shopping at the Brattle, I, I mean, it's fun on a day like today. I saw a whole bunch of people that I like. I talked to a whole bunch of people. Uh, I got to listen to all sorts of customers at the store and, and just smile at, at them, some of them encountering the store for the first time. The sale lot was absolutely full of dogs this time around, and two of them were beagles. That was <laughs> a completely unexpected added benefit. Uh, but the goal, really, is to get keepers when you're at the Brattle. Get, to get books that you're going to hold on to instead of just reading and cycling through. You can read and cycle through because the books are so cheap. But this, this, it feels a little bit foolish to, to, to do that on a large-scale basis. My goal is always to get things like this, to get things that I'm going to keep and just re-consult all the time. Uh, and Mark has one of, up in Vermont has a, a little book room of his own. He's uh, hardcore with his little book room, as he tends to be. His is not weatherized. So it's brutally hot during the summer and brutally cold during Vermont winters. It's not, you would have to put a space heater in there. And I'm not sure how habitable it would be for long periods of time in the height of summer, which I guess is here now. <laughs> I think we were expecting the height of summer at the end of July and into the early week, two weeks of August. But no, I think it's here early. But one way or another, I when I was up there, I would often film videos in his little book room, and I got a chance, while you're filming videos, I got a chance to look all around. And in that little room, I believe I saw a paperback of my next book. Certainly, when, the one time that I've ever owned this book, I owned it as a very distinctive blue and red paperback. Uh, and that paperback, I used this book when I had a reference shelf on my desk. I used this thing until it fell apart. So that paperback is long gone, and I've always told myself, you know, I'm not much for works of reference these days. Pretty much anything that I want to know, I can learn in a, in a fraction of a second online. And I, if I doubt its veracity, I can cross-check it also online, also in a fraction of a second. But this has so much lore in it that I knew that if I ever saw another paperback, uh, I would probably get it, even though the, I know the paperback falls, excuse me, falls apart. And then today, I found the hardcover. Unbelievable. I found the hardcover of the Oxford Companion to Ships and the Sea in a format that I have never seen before. I have never seen this. Uh, this, I, I don't, I, it's obviously the hardcover is not going to show you what the paperback looks like. There's the, there's the, the papers there. Uh, but this is, it's a dictionary of nautical terms, nautical places, nautical people. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. As a reference work, it's fantastic. I'm not not 100% sure that I would use it as a reference work, but as a, you know, to dip in and read from time to time, good lord, yes. 
Uh, so this is not the same thing that I saw in Mark's book room. It's not the, the distinctive blue and red paperback, but I'll take it, absolutely. <laughs> uh, this next one is a double. Uh, I got it first because it was... Oh, there's a little, little schmucks on the cover. First of all, I got it because it was dirt cheap. It was a dollar. And second, I got it because it's in perfect condition, better condition than the, the one that I have, that, of which it's a double. Uh, and third, because this is the kind of double that I can use. Uh, as a quarry for full-color illustrations if I want to make a book cover for something else. I do that. Uh, from time to time, I do that. And, you, you know, you need you need a double of a work in order to feel uh, at ease in your heart tearing out a color photo or cutting one out. You're not going to do that to a book that's not a double. Uh, but anyway, I found this, Civilization, uh, by Kenneth Clark. This is his lavishly illustrated uh a personal tour through 3,000 years of, of Anglo-European history. All it's, it's, This is not meant to be a scholarly work. It's very personal, but it's very, very readable, very good. And this is... Somebody put one of these plastic uh, coverings on this. I swear, I'm getting spoiled for those plastic coverings. I'm finding them in so many books, both at the Brattle and elsewhere. Uh, that I, This is probably the volume that I will keep and put in on the shelf and just take the older and rattier one off there and use it as a quarry for color images. Uh, then this next one, oh my, talk about find of the day. There were quite a few today. A while ago on this channel, I hauled a book uh, called St. Jerome in the Renaissance, a trade paperback, an orange trade paperback, uh, all about St. Jerome, the great, the great translator, the great Bible commentator, uh, really a bolt of lightning in, in, when you're surveying the literature of the, of the ancient world, especially the ancient world that is slowly trending towards being middle evil, medieval, it, Jerome stands out from everybody, even, in my opinion, St. Augustine, uh, for the clarity of his thinking, for the, the amazing snap of his Latin. Of, of, it just, he, he stands out for me as both a translator and uh, also his translating philosophy, uh, which reads as if it were written in the 21st century, and also for his biblical commentary, which I just love. I don't actually have any edition of Jerome's biblical commentary right now, and it there bloody well ought to be a Penguin classic of Jerome's biblical commentary. There bloody well ought to be, or at the very least, a huge fat volume of St. Jerome from Penguin or Oxford or anybody else that has not only segments of his translation, the Vulgate, the Vulgate Bible, or and also maybe letters, maybe essays, maybe some collection, some bits of his biblical commentary. The fact that there is no common volume like that for an author who's had such an enormous, enormous, really incalculable effect on European intellectual history is just a scandal. Just a scandal. But it's also fascinating for me for obvious, the obvious, well, maybe it's not obvious because I don't expect you all to memorize every detail of every video, but uh, the Dutch humanist Erasmus and I go way back, <laughs> way, way back. And Erasmus, like all the other biblical intellectuals, humanist intellectuals of his day, absolutely worshipped Jerome. Uh, and I got that trade paperback. I showed it to you. I think I waxed just as geekily about it then as I am doing now. Sorry about that. And I started to read that book. It has a whole chapter on Erasmus and Jerome. I think I started to read that chapter first. And the thing practically exploded apart. <laughs> it was an academic paperback. It was very cheaply made. It, it did not last even a whole reading. Only one excerpted paragraph was enough to kill it. And I admit, I wept a tear because I thought, you know, I, ordinarily I am not all that sentimental about my books. Ordinarily, I say the Brattle will provide. If something falls out a window, falls into a lake, is torn apart by a crowd of unruly beagles with their tails in the air, the Brattle will provide. I will just, I will see another copy. So I will just grab it when I see it. But an academic press, Johns Hopkins press, of a book about St. Jerome in the, in the Renaissance, I, I lost that book and wept a little tear because I thought, you'll never see that again. And not only did I find it again today at the Brattle, but I found it in hardcover, which will not fall apart. <laughs> I've had to reinforce it, but and I put the bookmark right back in at the chapter on Erasmus, but I found this again at the Brattle. This has happened a few times now. Uh, two science fiction-related books that I found for Mark Richardson happy to find them, happy to give them to him, thinking these are too niche for me to ever see again. And I, I, saw, I found them both in a month. And here's another one that I found, again, in a month. Incredible. So 
I, I will I will happily read the rest of the book now <laughs> now that I don't have to hold the individual pages and, and like that. And then the final book here is a little bit of a throwback. Every once in a while, the brattle can be counted on to serve up one of these big, lush bestsellers of yesteryear, whether it's Forever Amber or The Fire Pavilions or this book, which sold like crazy. Like crazy. This is Kathleen Cohn. This is Through Glass Darkly. And uh, Carlene Cohn wrote this when she was a housewife. Her husband, rather condescendingly, lovingly, but condescendingly said, you know, in the break between getting the kids out to school and the long gap between then and when you have to make me supper before I get home, maybe you should write something. <laughs> she was interested anyway. She was literary anyway. She was a working writer for a lot of her life. And she decided to just do that, to, to take her love of the 18th century, the grander, larger-than-life characters, the great writing of the 18th century in England, and craft a whole story out of that world. And she did. The, manus the, the final manuscript was absolutely enormous. And she shopped it around, and it was bought, and it was a bestseller, a New York Times bestseller for, oh God, months and months and months, maybe even more than a year. And the paperback, the paperback looked just like this thing. It was, it was, there was a purple, a fat purple paperback that sold, if anything, ten times more than the hardcover did. Just it made a pile of money. Just a perfect example, she did this fairly late in life, a perfect example to the rest of you that it is never too late to sit down and write that book that you want to write. She didn't follow any, car, any, any trends. She knew them quite well. She didn't do anything like that. She didn't chase an audience. She made an audience. She wrote a gigantic, this is basically a coming-of-age story, uh, a young woman who marries an older man who's not an ogre. The, her world is plagued with ogres, but he's not thoroughly one. Uh, and they, it's just her story. The, the, this whole book takes place over the course of, uh, I want to say, fewer than five years. And it has everybody from the era wa has a walk-on part of one kind or another, all kinds of secondary characters. And it is engrossing. From the first chapter, it is engrossing reading. Uh, no matter what the literary snobs of the day had to say about it. I, as, as I said at the time, as I've been saying ever since, and as I've said on this channel many times, your literary snobbery is not my problem. <laughs> you're hurting yourself, not me. You're not telling me anything except about yourself. Uh, I loved it. I read it first as one of those fat purple paperbacks. Uh, and this is a perfect example of, of what I'm saying. This is a per ought to be a perfect encouragement to you. We've already seen And Ladies of the Club by Helen Hoover St. Meyer, who waited twice as long to start writing fiction as Carleen Cohn did. Uh, also a massive bestseller, also a huge book. This, this should be a lesson to you, an objective lesson that you, it's never too late to start and what your muse is, for, I know it's a highfalutin term, but what your muse, what your inspiration is telling you you want to write is what you should write. If you do it with skill and passion, conviction, you will create an audience for it. You don't need to go chasing after one. Uh, but anyway, a, a thrill to find this in hardcover. It will go on the shelf with And Ladies of the Club and The Far Pavilion and others like this, I'm sure, will follow in time. There have been, every once in a while, reliably, there is a book like this. So uh, so there you go. That was a pre-Heat Wave Brattle book haul. Oh, we have Through a Glass Darkly. Uh, we have Jerome in St. Jerome in the Renaissance. Incredible to find this again in hardcover. Uh, we have Civilization uh, by Kenneth Clark. Uh, a double, but uh, probably a replacement for him. We have the Oxford Companion to Ships in the Sea in hardcover. <laughs> Good Lord. I know not much for reference works anymore, but I couldn't leave it behind. Uh, then Mary McCarthy's Theater Criticism, uh, also a find of the day. Elephant Days and Nights, uh, the, a definitive groundbreaking natural history of the Indian elephant. Uh, in Maine, the columns of the editor of Maine Times. Uh, the DA Cooks a Goose, Another book in this DA series. God knows when I'll see another one. Uh, the Postmaster of Market Dainton by E. Phillips Oppenheim. Always happy to crack open on Oppenheim, especially on a hot summer day. Uh, the Hack by Wilfred Sheed. Uh, and Ways of Loving by Brendan Gill, the author of Here at the New Yorker, which I believe I also saw at the Brattle, but I already have a heavily annotated copy of Here at, of Here at the New Yorker. So there you go. Those are the books that will that will stand me in good stead through a heat wave. What the, there's another person in this video, of course, and it's not Paul Marin, 
it's the bean. The bean is extremely vulnerable to the heat and doesn't want to admit that fact. She wants to go out and charge around at <laughs> full speed ahead, barking at, at other dogs, crying for humans to come to come down to her level and smooch with her nose to nose. And we can still do that, but it has to be short. The walks have to be short, and the, the ones that are marginally longer have to happen before sunrise and after sunset. If this weather gets as bad as advertised, we will see. I wanted to go to the Brattle just for fun to store to stock up before a heat wave, but also because the the same weather system that is bringing this heat and humidity is bringing unsettled air. There are quite a few days I would be willing to bet next week where there will be an omnipresent threat, real threat, 50% or more, of pop-up thunderstorms and downpours, and the Brattle sale lot is outside. <laughs> Those one dollar, three dollar, and five dollar carts are uncovered. They're open to the elements. So if the Brattle folk, if the people at the Brattle look at the sky, look at the forecast and say, I think it's going to rain on and off all day, it takes time to get them out, to get all those carts out into the lot and get them back in, uh, they probably will just keep the carts covered. Uh, so I doubt that I'll be going to the Brattle next week at all, unless the, all the predictions change. But I don't think they will. It'll either be way too hot, or it will be blustery, it will be, it'll be thunderstormy. Which has a, a very much a beauty of its own, but uh, it's not good for the Brattle sale. So, so this might have to, to tide both you over and me over in the meantime. I really think, uh, I mean, I, I always tell myself, you're getting these Brattle books from these Brattle sale halls. You're getting these, these books for your library, for the, the Donahue equivalent of the Rutenberg library. You're getting these books for your library. You're not getting them for immediate consumption. And it, you're not, it's not a waste of your time or a sign of hoarderism or some psychological eyes bigger than stomach imbalance to get all these books, even though you're not reading them right away. I always tell myself that, and then I almost always find the time to, to dig deep into the books that I just recently got. I said just the other day, I showed you, a, I hauled a book from the Brattle, the Mammoth Book of Locked Room Mysteries. And I, I very self-confidently said, well, you know, I, I have plenty of new stuff to read. It's not going to read itself. I have to review a lot of it. So I may dip into this. I may read one or two stories. I read the whole thing. Of course I did. And I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Same thing with that, that Canadian trade paperback of Wolf Hall. I got it because I'd never seen it before. I loved the format. And I thought, well, you know, you don't need to reread Wolf Hall anytime soon. I did. And I do all the time, and I'm looking at these books. Not only, of course, I want to finish the Jer St. Jerome in the Renaissance, but of course I want to finish that, but it's not very big. But I haven't read some of this Mary McCarthy theater criticism, and I will know a lot of the plays. And the D.A. Cooks a Goose, I absolutely loved this book. I, 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 another book with these same characters set in that same world is virtually irresistible. And... That's a huge undertaking even for me, but oh my, how tempting, <laughs> how tempting. So some, what I'm trying to say is some of this stuff is certainly going to win. <laughs> so, so, but anyway, that's your Brattle Mail Hall, or Brattle Book Hall. I don't think there'll be another one for, for a week, so I'll have to tide you over. A lot of you shop vicariously at the Brattle through me, uh, because you don't have anything like the Brattle where you live. I totally sympathize with that. I have lived for many, many years in places without any access to anything like the Brattle. So I'm happy to have you you know, visit the Brattle vicariously through my Brattle halls, but I'm afraid it's going to have to wait until the heat wave dissipates here in New England. Uh, I could be wrong about that. There might be a day that, that looks bad on paper now, but that will turn out to be just fine. But in the meantime, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up. And again, I want to know, how is the audio? How is the visual? Is this good enough? I'm not talking about studio quality, but will this get you through? If the consensus were that this particular technological setup really works, I would be overjoyed, because it's the one I want. Uh, but I will stoically go with whatever is best for you. Like any good parasocial relationship should be. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to wrap this up, but I'll be back. Thank you, too.